So, Jason Fitzgerald, welcome to the Adaptive Zone podcast. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Could you start by telling us just a little bit about yourself and your professional work? Yeah, sure. So uh, I am a runner. I'm a running coach. I host the Strength Running Podcast. And my work as a coach is really all around the, the central question, how can I help runners achieve whatever goal they, that, that they have? You know, so I, I work with runners who have some type of performance oriented goal, whether it's running a certain distance that they've never run before, getting under a certain time that they've never run before, you know, running a personal best, or even just going certain number of months without injury. You know, let me get through the season healthy and feeling good. So that that is really the the central premise of all of my work, whether it's on the Strength Running Podcast, whether it's on our YouTube channel or, or wherever I'm communicating to athletes, I really want runners to know that we can train more strategically. We can, uh, you know, really undergo more intelligent training that's going to make it a lot easier for us to achieve our goals and at the same time, reduce our injury risk, help us run more consistently. And I think that's much more exciting, right? Like we all want to be a little faster, be a little healthier. And that just leads us to have a lot more fun with our training. We can go on more group runs with our friends. We can, you know, run races that we're really proud of and just have more adventures with the sport of running. That is what I love to do. Yeah, it certainly comes through in your content that that passion and that real holistic, like running as a part of a life journey approach, like wanting to be great at it, but also wanting to enjoy it. And your content is fantastic. I'm sure you're familiar to most of the listeners of this show, the Strength Running Podcast and the YouTube channel are excellent. I've been watching and listening to them for years. And I mean, I suppose first off, just thank you for putting all that work out there. It's really, really good. And I've already prepared the links so people can check it out if they haven't already. Oh, thank you. I And to your listeners, I, I did not pay Matt to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today we're going to be talking about a very specific, um, let's say problem. And that's, uh, that's plateaus in performance. And I, and I really can't think of anyone I'd rather talk to about this. And to try and help us orientate around a specific um, situation, to then see, have a have a little bit of a window into how you think about things when you're working with people. I prepared a little um, like case study, which I've already shared with you just for the listener. I'm going to read it out now, and everyone will have to bear with me because my wife always makes fun of me when I'm reading to the baby in the evening because I'm just not very good at reading <laughs> out loud. So just give me a sec. But I'm going to read this little blurb, and then we're going to talk through this particular case study in terms of like performance plateaus and then see if you can walk us through how you might help this runner. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Let's hear more about Carrie. Okay, Carrie is a 34 year old runner. She is currently healthy and has done two marathons each year for the last four years. She took up running in her twenties and loves it because she finds it helps with stress and she enjoys running with her friends at the run club. She has two kids under 10 and she works part time. She's reached out to you, Jason, because she's unable to break her marathon PR, which currently stands for the last three years at three hours and 48 minutes. And she would really like to get it under three hours and 45 minutes. For a little context on Carrie's current running, she is doing about 40 to 60 kilometers per week on average. What's that in miles? About 40? That's about 25 to 37 miles per week. You are much better at converting that than me. <laughs> Um, she uses like most of her typical habit is each year to use a 20 week marathon training plan that she finds online. So do you have any qualifying questions about Carrie first? Anything more you'd like to know before we uh, get into the, the situation and how you might help her? I would be curious to hear if Carrie is running any other types of races throughout the year or if she's strictly the two marathon a year kind of runner. Okay. Do you mind if I ask why, why do you want to know that particularly? Well, what I'm looking for is variable experience in racing. And I'm also trying to get a handle on her other personal bests, you know, cause if mm. she's someone who 
you know, has a 348 marathon PR, we can, we can do the math here and say, okay, that's back to back 154 half marathons. Mm -hmm. If she wants to run faster in the marathon, she needs to have an equivalent performance in other races for it to be possible. Right? So it's sort of like if you're a, a two hour half marathoner, you really have no business going after a sub four marathon. Because what you're trying to do is essentially run a PR in the half marathon twice in a row. Mm, that yeah. is very difficult. You know, yeah. sort of like if you want to run a five minute mile, but you can't break two and a half minutes in the half mile, there, there's just no way that you're going to be able to double a better performance. It, it's just physiologically impossible. So I'm trying to get a handle on what her fitness level is like away from the marathon. What can she do in a 5k, 10k half marathon? Because it's sort of like the very opposite of the stock market. You know, we say in the stock market, past returns do not guarantee future returns, but in running, it's the opposite past performance absolutely does indicate future performance. So you can, you can imagine a four minute miler, very talented, very fast. One of the fastest runners in the world. If they go and run a 5k, they're not going to have a problem running six minute mile pace for a 5k. I mean, they are an enormously talented individual. So when we think about racing and, you know, the age old question that every runner loves to ask, what time do you think I could run in this race? Mm. I always then ask about their other races. Cause that gives me the best window into what they're capable of on the race course. So that's sort of what I'm trying to get at with these questions. Okay. So I'm just going to go off like some of the runners I've worked with and and because I want to make it somewhat realistic, right? I don't want to just kind of pluck numbers out there. So let's say she does a one or two half marathons each year. It's not her passion, but she feels like she's a bit better at it. And she can do that in one hour 45. And she's done that within the last 12 months. So that's her sort of current standard. And then let's say her 10K is, let's say 50 minutes. And the 5k is, let's say, let's say 23 minutes. Okay. Do, do they sound like reasonable places to start with? Yeah, that does sound reasonable without me doing a lot of public math to really see if they're, <laughs> which I try not to do. Not to do public, <laughs> public math, math is always a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, so they, they do sound roughly in line with the other race performances, right? So. You know, the first thing I would say is, you know, someone who can run a 145 half marathon probably should be able to run a 345 marathon, but it's also sort of within this gray area, this nebulous zone of, well, it could happen or it could not happen. It really depends on how you feel on race day, whether or not you're running a fast course, what the weather is like on race day. There's so many variables that might affect your performance on race day, especially with a marathon, because it's so long and you need to really take into consideration fueling and pacing to a much stronger level than you might if you were racing a 5k or a 10k. Okay. So now let's, let's have me play the role of Carrie and let's say, you know, I should have made this a male, but never mind. It's too late now. <laughs> she, so it's your, it's your sort of, uh, initial interview and you're talking about she's decided she's going to work with you, but you're trying to figure out where to start. Now, how, I know it's difficult, but how would you determine why, in your opinion, or what is your hypothesis for her being unable to break that 345, which seems to be within reach for her? Like, how would you go about developing a sort of theory of what the problem is? Yeah, so using the admittedly limited information I have right now, I would say that there's probably two low hanging fruits that I would start looking at first. Number one, and this is sort of like thinking long-term, I don't like it when runners do two marathons a year, every year. And hmm. you know, this, this gets to the point of, if you want to run a fast marathon, you have to be fast in, in other races too. And the marathon is so difficult. It's so long and challenging that it's hard to run a good marathon. You know, most marathoners, it's probably going to be a 50, 50 type of proposition. Half of your marathons are not going to go well. Half of them mm. will go well. And then within the half that go well, maybe 20% of them 
are going to be breakthrough races. So that is a difficult proposition because the thing with the marathon is if you have a bad race, you can't turn around and run another marathon the next weekend. Mm. But if you run a bad 5k, it's almost like who cares, you know, like, yeah. let's just go enter another 5k next weekend and you can exact your revenge on this distance and you yeah. can have a good race. Yeah. Whereas you're putting all your eggs in one basket with the marathon. So the first thing that I would say is let's take a season away from the marathon hmm. and let's focus on 5k, 10k, half marathon. And our only goal is to turn into a little PR factory. We are going to be running PRs in those shorter events. And because this runner has not focused on these races in years and years, but instead has been mostly doing marathon training, there's probably a lot of opportunity for improvement and getting mm. faster in these distances. And so like we talked about before, past performance does indicate future performance. So if you set a 5k PR and instead of 23 minutes, now you can run 2230 instead of 50 minutes. In the 10k you can run 49 minutes and instead of that 145 half marathon pr now you've been able to run 142 20. i'm just mm. making some numbers up mm. now i am much more confident in this runner reaching that goal of a 345 marathon you know i like to have runners let's stack the deck in your favor before you ever even line up on the marathon starting line so you know, you can kind of see this in the progression of the careers of elite marathoners, almost all of them, including the goat Kipchoge. He was a middle distance runner first. He got his times really, really fast in the 1500, the 3k, the 5k, the 10k. And then once he's become a fast runner, then he layers on the endurance and it's much easier to run a good marathon once you've already really worked on your speed and gotten fast at those shorter distances. So the first thing that I would tell Carrie is, would you be open to taking a season off from the marathon and working on other races? It, and it's not just because of this idea of equivalent performances. Yes, I want her to run an equivalent performance to a 345 marathon in the other events, but I also want her to do some different training, especially if this runner has been doing two marathons a year with 20 week training plans for four years, that means she really hasn't been doing any other type of training. There just mm -hmm. isn't really that much time throughout the year. If you factor in recovery, you know, some time off, you know, some unstructured easy weeks as you're getting back into things after the marathon. So this runner has only been doing marathon training for four years. She has been working on speed. She has been working on power. She has been working on you know, understanding how to change gears in a 5k and really produce a strong finishing kick. There's so many subtle physical skills that are developed when you focus on the shorter distances, as opposed to the marathon, which is, you know, sort of a steady effort for a very, very long time. Mm. So that's the first thing that I would look at. Yeah, that's interesting. That that's not really what I was expecting. So that, that's very interesting. Now, let's say with Carrie, taking this season to focus on shorter races will allow her to do more events and change up her training. And then the plan presumably would be to go back to the marathon the following season. So when you do that, are you more thinking this is more of a like a psychological sort of toughness and getting and a, a motivational thing in terms of like getting wins under the belt kind of thing? Or do you, are you looking more for like specific physiological changes that you want to use next year? Or is it both? It's a little bit of both. I would say I'm more interested in the physiological changes, but one benefit of this approach that I didn't get to mention is the fact that racing is a skill. Mm. Racing is a skill that can be built and developed over time. And if you're running two marathons a year, maybe one or two half marathons, you're not getting a lot of racing experience. So the psychological side to this approach is I want you racing a lot. I don't want you to put racing on this pedestal where it's this big, serious thing and we're going to get really nervous ahead of it. And, you know, there's all this pre-race anxiety because you've been preparing for this day for five months mm. and 
everything is, is leading up to this one day. Again, it's that all your eggs in one basket phenomenon. Instead, I want you to run, you know, six races in a season, 5K, two 5Ks, two 10Ks, maybe two half marathons. And you start just not, I don't want to say you don't care, but there's a certain callousing of your psychology when it comes to the discomfort of racing. You're, you're sitting on the starting line and you're sort of laughing about it. You know, oh man, this is going to hurt. I mm. can't wait. You know, and you're not intimidated as much by the act of racing, which let's face it is difficult. It puts us in a very different psychological space than we almost ever experience in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, when are you ever in an, in an environment where your brain is telling you that there is a threat to homeostasis, that you need to slow down because your blood and muscles are becoming acidic. You are feeling that buildup of lactate and everything in your brain is screaming at you to slow down or stop. That's not something most people experience ever. And it's something runners only experience during very difficult workouts or races. Mm. And if we can experience that a little bit more often with the shorter races, because it's much more manageable, it's much more sustainable. It does present this, this wonderful callousing of your mindset where you do develop some mental toughness. You do certainly, you know, just not think of racing as this thing I do once every four to six months, but Hey, I'm a runner. I race and yeah, it hurts, but yeah, that's okay. That's just part of the game. And, mm. and, and I really like that, that development of the runner psyche over time, but I only think it can be developed if you race frequently. So it's certainly both physical and psychological, you know, that psychological piece I think is important, but I'm mostly looking for the physiological side of things. I want this runner to be doing different training, to be developing more speed and power. That's going to help with their running form and their economy. You know, running a lot helps with your economy, mm -hmm. but so does drills and speed work and, you know, some more power oriented strength training. All those things are typically either dialed back or completely ignored during marathon training. And you know, that, that leads to a less developed athlete. And so by switching the event and, and doing different types of training, you are really building a much more robust athlete who's capable of more things. Yeah. They're capable of running the marathon, but they're also capable of running a fast 5k. They're capable of a heavy deadlift or a squat in the gym. They can do drills. You know, they can look fluid and graceful when they do those drills and that's going to carry over into their running form. So there's so much to love about a season where you're not just banging out, you know, 30 kilometer long runs or, you know, these, these more marathon pace workouts, but you're working a little bit more on the technical skill of running fast. And that surely has carry over to the marathon. Yeah. You mentioned running form, running economy. And I've heard you talk about this, that you, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but listening to you, you, you really emphasize, you know, workouts, uh, speed, um, running fast and sustaining it hills and things like that in terms of developing running economy rather than specific cues or analysis and that kind of thing. Is that, is that your current position? And is that improving running biomechanically and improving running economy? Is that one of the principal benefits you're looking for with carry focusing on this, essentially what will be a lot more fast running? for her. Yeah, it is. It is like a big benefit to this is that I think this, our hypothetical runner carry is going to improve her economy much better. Um, you know, I take a pretty holistic view of things, you know, I think cues are incredibly helpful. Um, they have to be given at the right time. They have to be understood and executed properly, but you know, a combination of high mileage, a lot of speed work, drills, cues, weightlifting, you know, those are some of the best things to improve your running form. Um, and, you know, we certainly don't have to get too dogmatic about any one of those, you know, they're, mm. they're all helpful. They all work with a slightly different mechanism, but if you can safely incorporate all of those things, then very good things will happen and your running form will improve. Now, one thing I want to add is, you know, you were saying how I'm sort of, uh, uh a big proponent of speed work and hills and, and running fast. That doesn't necessarily mean I want runners to be running very hard, very often. So I think there's this key distinction between fast 
and hard. I think runners should give themselves a lot of experience with running fast, but relatively little experience running very hard. And so that, that there's, that's a big difference. And I'll give you a, a great example. If you go to the track and you run three times a mile or 1600 meters at your goal 5k pace with a 90 second jog recovery, that is a very fast workout. It's also a very hard workout. That workout is pretty much as hard as a 5k you're running your goal pace you're getting limited recovery you're running just about 5k worth of speed work that's a challenging workout that is a very 5k specific workout that you would do very late in a 5k season turn that around you can go run strides or or even hill sprints which are shorter and faster but you get full recovery these aren't even really considered workouts this is almost like a drill where you can experience running fast, but it's in such a short amount, it's in such a low dose that it's not actually very difficult. And so we, if we can get runners to consistently and frequently run fast without making it super hard, good things are gonna happen. Your economy is gonna improve, your coordination and your general athleticism and proprioception is all gonna improve. You know, sprinting or even running say mile or half mile race pace is hard to do. It, it's a coordinated movement and it does take practice. So one of the big things I see with adult runners, especially marathoners, and especially marathoners who only run marathons year after year after year, is they don't really run fast very frequently. Yep. And so their economy <laughs> suffers, their power output suffers. And I would love runners, you know, let's do strides regularly. If you're a little bit more advanced, let's do hill sprints. We can run some shorter hill reps, you know, 30 seconds at, at a pretty, you know, I'll say a, a fast effort, but we're getting more recovery. So it's not super challenging. These are fantastic workouts for getting comfortable running fast without all the stress of a very challenging workout. Yeah. I mean, that is, it's one of those phrases I hear every couple of months and it always makes me chuckle when you give someone a sprint interval workout that like, I haven't sprinted in like 10 years. What are you talking about? <laughs> just because they get so used to marathon pace type training and, and below that they, they literally haven't sprinted sometimes in five or 10 years. And I think then you miss out on a lot of the adaptations that that sprinting, I mean, we're talking about running form benefits and running economy, but also in terms of uh, power, in terms of anaerobic development and these kinds of things, which you do need at periods during the marathon, if you're going to perform well. And, and a lot of people just haven't experienced that in a very long time. Yeah, for sure. Now, I, I didn't actually mention the second thing, the second piece of low hanging fruit that I would work on with Carrie. Did you want to move into that? Or do you want yep. to talk about this more? No, no, let's uh, what's the next bit? So the other thing that I was going to mention about Carrie is that it seems like she's a relatively low mileage runner with her peak mileage coming in at around 60 kilometers a week. You know, for our U S listeners who prefer the Imperial units, that's not even 40 miles a week. So now that Carrie is running, what I'll say is actually pretty close to a, a Boston marathon qualifying time, I think for her age, what is she? She's 34 years old. Uh, for a 34 year old to qualify for the Boston Marathon, she has to run, let's see, let's look at the table here, three hours and 30 minutes. So she's actually getting pretty close to that BQ time. And I think the more competitive you become as a runner, the more advanced you become, you know, the more uh, uh, difficult you know, it becomes to keep up with you on the race course. You are getting better and better. And as you become better and better in a more advanced runner, your training has to keep up with that. So all of a sudden, you know, if Carrie, yes, tomorrow goes and runs a 325 marathon and then wants to continue that progress, she's going to do some things in her training to really continue that progress. And usually with running, you know, it's, it's a question of more. And a lot of runners don't like to hear that, you know, they, they want the, the run less run faster approach, but you know, at a certain point, your body becomes adapted to the training stress that you subject it to. And after a certain amount of time, you just don't really get the same adaptations. So 
it seems like Carrie is having sort of like the same marathon training cycle, cycle after cycle mm. after cycle. You know, she's sticking with the same mileage levels. She's sticking <clears> with the same race distance, the marathon, and she's sort of getting the same results. And we all know what the definition of insanity is, right? Like doing <laughs> the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So if Carrie was unwilling to take a season off from the marathon. She's like, no, I just love the marathon. I, I got to do it. I'd be like, okay, you're the boss. I'm just the coach. I'm here to help you. So let's tackle the marathon. And the next thing that I would do is we need to get you running a little bit more. Now I'm not going to have her go up to hundred kilometers in a week. You know, that is probably way too much for her body to handle, but I would see if we could get her peak mileage to be, you know, somewhere in the seventies, maybe up to 80 kilometers in a week. I think once you start getting up to about 80 kilometers in a week and, and anything beyond that, that really starts to become a more competitive level of weekly mileage. And you just start getting a lot more adaptations. You get a lot stronger, you know, those marathon pace runs and, and tempo or lactate threshold efforts, they start to feel a lot easier just because your aerobic capacity has, has been developed over time. And when we're talking about the marathon, the number one physiological adaptation that's going to help us at this race distance is aerobic development. Now, how do we develop the aerobic system? We do it a lot of different ways. One of the best is simply running more, more easy mileage. We are not going to do this at a hard effort. In fact, when you're building mileage, a lot of that mileage is going to be at a relatively easy recovery effort. You know, goal number one is simply let's cover the miles, even if they're super slow. Goal number two is, okay, let's, let's, structure this mileage a little bit more uh in a more competitive way you know with workouts maybe you're doing some progressions maybe not every easy run is a recovery run so mileage is probably the second thing that i would look at because for a more competitive runner like carrie who's starting to flirt with that boston qualifying time we need to get her running more and uh that's just going to lead to a lot of really great development on her side yeah okay so let's say that we have two things there that you would like to work on let's say she's up for it she's like okay well let's do these fives these tens these half this season let's take this season to work on those shorter distances and with a view to build a foundation for next year we'll come back and try and get the marathon vr and she's up for that and then your let's say let's just do it from now so it's may now so we're right at the start of the season in this part of the world and <clears throat> Trying to increase her mileage and switch into those faster distances, which I presume, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, would necessitate a change in her training in terms of the workout she's doing, probably more intensity and less long, slow distance. Can you do those both together? Would you do it one at a time? Would you take part of the season for part of it? Like, how would you approach that at this time of year? Yeah, great question. I think. First, if you are going to take that season away from the marathon, focus on the shorter distance events, we should always keep an eye towards the next season. So the next season, Carrie is going to be running a marathon. This season is really designed to simply put her in a better position at the beginning of marathon training to have a more productive training season and ultimately run a faster marathon. So this entire season is really about the marathon. So that means a couple things. Number one, we shouldn't get so aggressive with hard workouts and speed works that she gets injured. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's introduce a lot of faster running, but maybe not a lot of hard running. So again, it comes, comes back to that issue of we're going to do a lot of fast running. We're going to do some hard running, but it's not going to be brutally difficult. The second thing we're going to do is we are going to maintain a good long run distance throughout this season of focusing on the shorter races, because, you know, if you just stop doing a long run, it's going to be hard to jump into a marathon cycle after the season when, you know, say you haven't run 15, 16, 18 kilometers in a very, very long time. Now you're going to need a long time up to 20 weeks to gradually build your long run distance. I would much rather see Carrie maintain a long run of let's say at least 20 kilometers. You know, we got to be in, you know, if we were using us units, I would say we got to be in the double digits. So 10 miles or more. Uh, but at a very minimum, I'd love to see 20 to 26, 28 kilometers. I, I think it's very instructive when we look at some of the fastest middle distance runners in the world, even with a 1500 meters, they're still running, 
you know, up to 30 kilometers, sometimes even 32 kilometers for their long run, because even the 1500 meters is predominantly aerobic. Mm -hmm. So of course we want to maintain a good long run so that Carrie is still developing her aerobic system. Cause that's the name of the game. And that's also going to help her shorter distances. So it, it's never a question of either, or it's always a question of both and how can we do it safely? Yeah. So I would probably give her a lot of early season hill work to build strength while we're building mileage. And then, you know, once she gets up to maybe 50 kilometers in a week, I think that's a great sort of maintenance level for this runner. Then we'll, we'll stop really building mileage. You know, maybe her long run might tick up a little bit over time, but then we can start focusing on the harder workouts, you know, so strides, hill sprints, short hill reps, those are all going to introduce her to speed work, build some strength. Um, and then of course, the other side to this equation is let's continue to do some strength training so that you, you're staying healthy, you're developing tougher joints and connective tissues. You're really allowing the body to handle more load. And that's what strength training really does for runners. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I would look at for, for this season, you know, maintaining some mileage, you know, it might not get as high as marathon training doesn't necessarily have to, but we are going to maintain a good long run. We're going to introduce fast, not necessarily hard running early and maintain the strength training so she can stay healthy. Okay. So, so we're going to, we're going to put pin in strength training. I know you know a ton about it and you talk a lot of in your content. Um, and I'd like to push you on to try and get you back on in the future to talk specifically about this because it's, it's a bit of a bigger topic and I wanted to, to get your sense of how you would approach it when running um side of the training so let's let's say you're you're incorporating effective strength training throughout this process but not much too much detail on now so get a sense that we're going to be her weekly mileage and we're going to focus on these water races and so I presume you're going to have that longer run probably at the weekend. Most people do it. And it's probably going to be in zone two on five zone system, which my listeners will be familiar with. And other workouts, let's say she's doing, let's say she's running six times a week. You know, would you have like, you know, do one in full session and then a bunch of steady running? Would you have like every other session be like a different type of interval stuff? stuff? Would it change at different points of the sauce? So next couple of months, how, how would you approach designing the weeks in terms of what kinds of workouts would be included in a sim single week? Like how would you decide? And what do you think might be too much? Yeah, another really good question. So yes, it's going to change over time. You know, let's just imagine that Carrie is doing, you know, about a 16 week training cycle. Uh, I would say for the first couple weeks, we're only going to do one workout a week, and then we'll probably move to two. Um, the early weeks might be very similar to base training or very similar to marathon training. So, you know, we're going to do um, maybe some marathon pace work, maybe some tempo or lactate threshold work. Uh, we're going to be consistent with strides. And the, when the second workout kicks in, that workout is going to be like a B workout. It's not going to be too hard. It's not going to be very long. Uh, something like, you know, four to six times 30 seconds up a steep hill, something like that with full recovery. So it's an introduction to fast running. It's not as easy as strides. It's definitely a workout. So it is, it is starting to become hard, but it's also not nearly as hard as a longer workout. You know, if you do six times 30 seconds uphill, it's only three minutes of quality running. It's not a high volume. So we do need to make sure that this, the, the pace is there and it's done on a hill that's going to elicit the adaptations that we want. Um, as we get further into the training cycle, I think the, the lactate threshold workouts will get longer. Uh, we will eventually move to more race specific workouts where, you know, let's just say we're doing, you know, like that example workout I gave you earlier, three times a mile or 1500 meters or something like that at your goal 5k pace with a short recovery, maybe one to two minutes. It really mimics the demands of the 5k. So th those are examples of like the polar opposite workouts. You know, you get your threshold workout on one side, you have your very race specific 5k workout on the other, which is like a VO2 max workout. And 
the whole idea of the training plan is to gradually bring the runner from the less specific threshold workout that nonetheless is a wonderful workout. I, I like to say that tempo runs at lactate threshold, this is like one of the best types of workouts that any runner can do, whether you're a miler or you race the ultra marathon distances. Because what this does is really buffer your capacity to run faster without going into oxygen debt. So your body gets really good at clearing that lactate and you can start running a little bit faster before you go anaerobic. So the tempo run really never goes out of style. It's wonderful mm. for all runners. You're going to see it at the beginning of my marathon plans and the beginning of my 5k plans. They're, they're fantastic. But soon we might start doing, you know, a little bit of tempo running and then some faster repetitions. And then gradually we phase out the tempo portion of the workout and we're doing all you know, 5k, 10k, uh, mile or two mile paced work in, in one workout. And then that B workout, the second workout is going to be a little bit more speed oriented. So this is where I like to see fast, but not hard running. And for most runners, two hard workouts a week in a long run is a lot to manage. And, mm -hmm. you know, Carrie has two kids under 10. She works part-time. She's not a pro runner. She probably has a little bit more stress in her life. She probably doesn't have the schedule flexibility that someone who's a professional runner has. So I don't want to overload this, this person with just a ton of intensity. Um, so yeah, that's how I would generally, uh, progress the workouts. And then, you know, that B workout, you know, maybe we're starting with four 30 second Hills, you know, that can morph into four to six times 200 meters. So now we're, we're, we're essentially turning these Hill segments into flat segments. Now running on flat ground is a little riskier. You know, there's more impact because you're not landing on that uphill surface. Um, and there's less strength adaptations that come from it. So you're working a little bit more on pure speed and because it's a little riskier and because it's a little bit more specific to the demands of the 5k, it's going to come a little bit later, you know? So the hill work kind of prepares you for running fast on flat ground. And then, you know, we may change these workouts into, you know, something kind of short and simple that I love is something like two by 400 plus four by 200. Again, it's only about a mile worth of speed work, not very long, but boy, you get a great speed stimulus with that kind of a session. And when you combine that with a tempo or even more race specific workout earlier in the week, and then your long run on the weekend, you're building a lot of the systems that are then going to be capable and will help power you through that 5k. So if we were thinking about the kind of anchor points of how you're building the week, you're starting with long run plus hill sessions and then some other runs and then you're building towards long run plus hills plus tempo so you've got now two workouts in the long run and then you're looking towards long run um i would call them sprint intervals and and then you i wasn't sure and then one more workout uh, so before I ask my next question, have I, have I understand that correctly in terms of the progression of how you would develop carry? Yes. Yes. I, I think I would probably start with some of the easier aerobic workouts and then, you know, within three, maybe four weeks, start adding in those shorter hill sessions. So, okay. The, so the you would lay a bit of a base first and then, and then bring the hills in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. we might be doing uphill strides or hill sprints. So there is going to be a little bit of hill work. I love to have runners go do their long runs on hilly terrain. So, you know, we're always kind of incorporating many elements of sound training. It's just like, what are we focusing on? You right. know, we're not really focusing on hard workouts or even hill workouts right now, but sure, we're going to be running some hills. So it's almost like a matter of the dose, you know, we're, we're going to include almost everything, almost all the time, but the dosing is going to be very different. Okay. And then my question about that, that other workout was you, you talked about tempo and race pace, and you mentioned threshold. I would, I was wondering if you could maybe just, um, extrapolate on what you mean by all of those and what you're, what you're going for. And do you have different types of workouts, maybe some examples of, of each? Yeah. Oh, let's, maybe we can start with the, on the slow end and we'll go yep. to the fast end. 
So on the cool. slow end, you have your recovery runs, you know, zone, low zone two. Then you might have a normal base run or easy run. This would be your long run. This is also zone two. Maybe you flirt a little bit with zone three at the end of the run. You know, not 100% of your easy runs have to be in zone two. You know, I think right now every coach is, is sort of like in a, a romantic relationship with zone two, but all the zones are important, <laughs> you know. Zone one has its place. So does zone three. It sort of depends on, again, the dose. Most of it should be in zone two, however. And then from there, you have marathon pace. That gets a little faster. That's certainly zone three somewhere. Half marathon pace, I would say, is very high zone three, maybe low zone four. Then you get into tempo, which I use tempo to, to mean lactate threshold. I don't want to use all those science words all the time. I think it turns off mm -hmm. a lot of runners. But yep. tempo is essentially lactate threshold. This is right on the border between aerobic and anaerobic. Right mm -hmm. before you go into oxygen debt, you are in this lactate threshold zone. Now, lactate threshold is also about, if you're well-trained, it's about your one hour race pace. So if you're a 10,000 meter runner and you run a 10K in about an hour, your tempo pace is about your 10K pace, depending on your, your ability. From there, you know, if you're running 50 minutes or less in the 10K, then there's your 10K pace, which is an anaerobic pace for the duration that we're running it. And then there's your, you know, your 8K pace, 5K pace, and it sort of just goes down there in, in race distance. Uh, as soon as you get down to, for sure, 8K, but definitely 5K pace, now we're venturing into that anaerobic territory where these workouts become a lot more challenging. So if you're doing any sort of longer reps at 5K pace, 3K pace, 8K pace, it, that, that becomes very challenging. So those are the workouts that I tend to stay away from for a lot of runners, or I just give them in small doses because that's where the injury risk is its highest. Um, now you asked about the goals of the different workouts, or I just want to make sure I'm answering this. Uh, no, I like, think, I think you got, I think you covered what I was, what I was getting at there is, um, I, I understand that you're looking for different physiological developments at, with those different workouts. And it sounds like it would get, as you went up the, up the scale there, as the weeks and months are progressing this season with Carrie, you would be moving that second workout more towards, more up your scale as you described it there. Is that right? Yeah, so I would, I would actually say if we're thinking of both the, the A workout, which maybe starts at that tempo work, and the B workout, which is the very short, fast sessions, we're almost starting at each end of the spectrum and we're gradually towards the end of the season going to meet in the middle. So this is, this is a different periodization model than the strict linear periodization model, which would have you go from slow to fast over the course of the season. When it comes to your workouts, I like to introduce the faster running, you know, let's keep it, eat, let's keep it fast, but kind of easy in that B secondary workout of the week. And we're almost you know, building a pyramid where we're coming at our goal race effort from two different sides, from the endurance side and from the speed side. And, and we're gradually going to make both of those workouts a little bit more specific to the goal race. So the idea is hopefully by the end of the training season, you are ready for a workout that's similar to your goal race, like three times a mile at 5k pace. So that goes really well. This summer brings you through, let's say you've done right through until September and she's done a bunch of those five and 10 Ks and a half marathon and it all went really well. And she comes into winter and then she wants to marathon PR attempt next year. A couple of questions. How would you approach the winter? And then would it be, and this you'll need to know if you're going to answer that is, would it be better for her to go for her attempt in the spring or the fall or in the middle of the summer? Like, how would you how would you structure that whole period between now and next season? I think first and foremost, we just have to make sure that Carrie is recovering enough in between seasons. So, you know, this shorter distance season might be a little stressful for her because she's not used to these speed workouts. You know, maybe I have her doing some heavier weightlifting than she's she's used to. And so we're adding workload to her training 
but not from a volume perspective. She's used to running more, but it's just easier. So now we're going to run less, but we're going to add some intensity. So it might be challenging for her, but if it's going well, she runs all these races. Hopefully she sets several PRs. She's feeling good about herself. You know, let's, let's not, you know, ignore the confidence piece to this. You know, she's going to be feeling great. You know, man, I just set a PR in all these races. You know, that is powerful. We shouldn't discount that. The next thing I would have her do is let's, let's take some time off from running. You deserve it. You just had a, you know, maybe a 16 week ish cycle. So let's take some time away from running depending on how much time you need. That could be as little as four days. It could be as much as two weeks. If the runner is a little bit more mentally burned out from training and they just, oh, yeah, I get it. Sometimes, you know, I'd run my goal race and I wouldn't want to think about running for a while. You know, I just mm. need that psychological recovery. Once she's recovered, let's just say roughly a week, then we might have a couple weeks of just easy, unstructured training. She might not even be on a training plan for one or two weeks. Let's get you running, you know, three to five days a week, short, easy. Maybe in week two, we start re re reintroducing strides. We never want to get too far away from just the very fundamental act of running fast. So we'll reintroduce strides. And then from there, we can start building into the next training cycle. So essentially, Carrie has taken about three weeks away from formal training. It's been a week off, and then it's been about two weeks of, you know, easy running. She's going for group runs with her friends. I know that's something she enjoys. She's not putting any pace expectations. She's not doing any workouts. You know, she's not really doing a long run. You know, she might do a 12 kilometer long run, a 16 kilometer long run. It, it's getting up a little bit over time, but the first couple of weeks, it's nothing too substantial. At this point, Carrie's recovered. She's psychologically recovered. She's physically recovered, and she's probably itching to get back into the routine of training because now she's excited again about the marathon. So my perspective on recovery is as much mental as it is physical. I want the, the athlete to be excited about the upcoming mm. training season. If they're not, they're probably not mentally recovered enough because, you know, they're just, they're going to get into it. And then all of a sudden they're just, oh man, I got to get up at five in the morning again. And you start resenting your training. We don't want to yep. be in that position. And then from there, we can sort of just start focusing on her marathon prep. And, and at this point, who is Carrie now? Carrie is a better runner. She has set PRs in all these distances. She's gotten faster, she's gained confidence, and she's well recovered, but she's also in good shape. She's gonna carry the fitness from those PRs into her marathon season. She's been consistently doing a, a decent long run, so she's not gonna to have to spend the next 20 weeks gradually building the distance mm -hmm. of her long run. She might be able to jump in with a 20 kilometer long run. And then the next week she runs 22, and the next week she's at 24. And then maybe from there, we're more conservative with building the distance. But the key is we're not spending the entire 20 weeks building the distance of the long run. Instead, we're going to get up to that 30, 32, maybe 34 kilometer distance. And then we're just going to be consistent with that. Sure, we should have some recovery weeks, uh, but we're going to be consistent with it. We're going to add some goal marathon pace running to those runs and really start focusing a bit more on quality. So that's generally speaking, like how I would think about merging these two seasons. Uh, as long as we are thinking in terms of cycles. So every runner should always think in terms of cycles. You know, I am going to go from a period of inactivity. This is my rest period to a period of easy running. This is unstructured. It builds into like a base training type of approach. And then you start adding workouts. Then you become, you know, you're in the, the more race specific phase of your training. Then you get into the peaking phase where you're running your races you know, maybe your volume comes down, you start tapering, you run your goal race. Well, what do you do next? This is a very common question I get. What do I do after mm. I run my goal race? You right. start the cycle over again. You're going to rest. You're going to have some easy unstructured running and then boom, the cycle continues. Now the goal race might change, which I think it should. We shouldn't like, uh, my bias is definitely against the two marathon a year approach. Mm -hmm. So if the goal race is changing, we're still, we're still training within this cycle. So as long as we're thinking in terms of cycles, Carrie is going to be well recovered and building on her fitness over time. You know, it's going to progress. Final question then, I think to bring it home, spring, summer, fall, 
you know, we've brought her right through into the start of the following year. Um, what are you thinking about when you're thinking timing in terms of the push for the marathon? Well, I do sort of like to see runners set themselves up for success when it comes to scheduling their marathon. So for us Northern Hemisphere folks, if you're scheduling your marathon in mid-July and it's a 10 a.m. start, you're probably not going to run very fast. <laughs> you are going to be struggling with heat and humidity. You know, I used to have a very, uh, I still have a very fast friend. He was a 225 marathoner, very talented. And he always used to joke around that in the heat, I don't compete. You know, it's just this right. funny line of saying like, why bother putting yourself through the stress of running, especially a marathon, if you're just, if you just know you're not going to run very well. It's, it's like going to run the Antarctica marathon and expecting to run a PR there. You're not going to be able to do that. <laughs> That's a good so, analogy. <laughs> I typically don't like runners to, to race marathons in, uh, in the, in the summertime. You know, I have one private client who's running the, the Fargo marathon on May 20th. And that is a little bit late in the season for my liking, but it's in North Dakota here mm. in the United States pretty much in Canada. So it's a little bit cooler. You're, he's not going to be dealing with, you know, very high temperatures. Um, so probably springtime for Carrie, I, I yeah. think, you know, if she's getting into her marathon training in the winter, let's just say December or January, she can probably run a really good April or maybe May race. And, and that, that means you're going to avoid the dramatic heat of the summer. And it's also just an interesting timing. You know, I, I love the sequence of this because if we wait a very long time, well, what are we going to do now? Right. Yeah. So Carrie has yeah. to do something in the spring. She can't just take the spring off because as we know, running is cumulative. It builds on it on itself over time. Your fitness progresses and builds on itself over time. If you take three to six months off from running because, oh, I'm not doing any races this season. I'll just wait until the fall. Well, what's going to happen? You're going to become detrained. Your, your physical, you know, ability is going to decline over time. So I wouldn't wait too long. I would probably have Carrie, you know, after those couple of weeks of rest and easy unstructured running, let's get right back into marathon training. Um, you know, the first couple of weeks of that aren't going to be very hard. So she's probably having at least a month, but probably six to eight weeks of relatively easy training. You know, the workouts are not going to be super challenging. So I'm not worried about her rushing into a season. I'm not worried about her not being recovered enough. I'm actually pretty confident that she's recovered enough to roll all that fitness into her marathon cycle. And if she, we can keep her healthy, if we can do a little bit more than what she did in her prior marathon seasons, you know, a little bit more mileage, a little bit more consistent long runs, she's probably going to be able to run a much faster marathon. You know, I'm, I'm tempted to keep going because I could uh, I could ask you questions all day, Jason, but you've been extremely generous with your time and I want to let you go. And I think that's a really great place to end. And I'm confident that everybody listening is going to want to hear more from you. So where would you direct them to if they wanted to learn more from you? Well, my home base is strengthrunning.com. That's where you can find, you know, the, the strength running blog where I've written probably close to a thousand articles on all kinds of different running topics uh, that are searchable. So if you have a question, you can just search the website for that. Uh, the Strength Running Podcast is also available if folks want to hear me interview other subject matter experts about physical therapy and strength training and sports psychology and, you know, all the issues that are important to runners. Um, yeah, and I'm also on Instagram if you want to message me with a question uh, or if you like funny running memes, you know, I'm at Jason Fitz one Yep. Uh, I follow you in all of those places and you have a different feel to all of those platforms as well, which is great. So you d different sides of you and different um, perspectives on the things that you're obviously very passionate about. So I will put links to all of those things in the show notes. And I, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for giving us the, your time this morning. It was wonderful. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Oh, I appreciate it, Matt. This was a really good conversation. And, and I just got to say, I love this case study approach because it's so specific. We can mm. really get into, you know, the, the, the little nitty gritty details of how we might structure training and seasons for, you know, a hypothetical runner. So this was really great. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Went well. I, I use it a lot when I'm developing my own content because it helps you 
like think things through it becomes less like um vague and you can be really specific which you were and i think a lot of people will go back listen to this over again because i i know i will be uh so i'll uh i'll stop the recording there thanks jason appreciate it <laughs>